two, three. And they tell us ain't no class war. Tell that to the working poor. Tell it to the dreary eyed souls on the assembly line. Tell it to those working mandatory overtime. Tell it to the post live juggling three jobs. Walking home late at night worrying about getting robbed. Tell it to the immigrants on their way to or do the jobs that they tell us that we just won't do. And tell it to the kids raised up to be dummies. Cause they wasn't born in school districts with money. Tell it to the sweatshop girl with tears down her face. Disrespected and humiliated on the daily Places. Tell it to the crash shivering at the bus stop. Tell it to the young brother getting hassled by the cops. Tell it to the father who can't afford to be sick. Tell it to the sister thinking about turning tricks. And tell it to the single mother downsized on Christmas Eve. While the CEO got a 20 mil bonus up the sleeve. Who we kidding? A world you live in where most folks never leave. The class they was given the whole concept of the American dreams about trading in your rags to be on the rich team. But why can't your dream be to get rid of class when no one individual or group can amass the juice of opportunity to rule anyone else? We want an economy where you only rule yourself. The one with equity, solidarity, self-management, and diversity, classlessness, the whole goal of party kind with institutions to produce the kind of world we want. Classism is got to go. Check the chorus coming up from below, from below Telling all those who only know being oppressed Ring the bell, it's just over, yo, it's class dismissed Classism, it's got to go No more food chain running the show, running the show So for all those who been getting their ass rich Guess to ring the bell, time's up, I said it's class dismissed Ring the bell, class dismissed Not meaning that we don't take class serious Cause if you're hearing this, well then you know we do And if you think this is dressed up communism Market economy, or we won't hide, nor do we want an economy. The central decided marks out the masses, mainly in two classes. Workers and owners, but power falls up the boys and glasses. While they were steady, busy, missing the one. Some, some would say they was missing the third one. The only class capitalists are allowed to mention. We're talking those in the middle of the system, the middle and upper middle class who call the shots. Enforce the rules written by those up top, like volunteer referees. So the game runs clean. It's the same bitch slap used by capitalist pimp. Classism is got to go. Check the chorus coming up from below, from below. Telling all those who only know being oppressed. Bring the bell, let's just say for your class is here. Classism is got to go. No more food chain running the show, running the show. So for all those who been getting their ass rich, guess to ring the bell. Time's up, I said this class is missed. Hey, yo, class ain't just about cash. Let me explain where the properties only one link in the food chain. Who makes your schedule? Who signs your test? Who writes the laws? Who places the ads? Who runs your show? Or who show you run? Or what classes are below? What classes above? Labor competition relies on the vision. What groups are allied to monopolize the system? Some status entitled to work and working conditions Self-management is proportionate to bargaining position We are for unity but not in the service of class Or one group wears the head and another the ass Big shots and big knots, what kind of pull you got? When it's all about the ladder, it's all about your spot And don't forget power's just as much about info That's why those who hold a card know to hold them close Keeping us in the dark, keeps expectations low And low self-esteem don't demand much dough <laughs> Yo, it's time we come together as equals from every capital building to every shiny church. The steeple, I holler out loud. We're tired of class of war. People need a plan that ensures people adores people in the economy with choices that don't ignore people a vision and dream to restore people. Faith in one another where we don't see each other as the other. Every woman is a sister, every man a brother. Just remember classism ain't the lastism. The food chain employs all kinds of isms and wasted gender, sexual preference, and more. Economics is only one door we breaking down. Class is always got to go. Check the chorus coming up from below, from below. Telling all those who only know being oppressed. To ring the bell, it's just over your class is dismissed. Class is always got to go. No more food chain running the show, running the show. So for all those who've been getting their ass rich, guess to ring the bell. Time's up, I said it's class is dismissed. Class is always got to go. And yeah. 
Så skal vi over engelsk. Welcome again uh, to Tina McWay, and she's uh, a comrade from Ireland, and she's a member of the Socialist Workers' Party in Ireland, and she's a community worker, and she's also running for election in the uh, area where she's active. So, so hopefully sh she can share a lot of the experiences that they had in Ireland from the struggle against austerity and so on and so on. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, it's really nice to be here. It's not my first time in Denmark. I studied in Roskilde for six months, about ten years ago, so it's nice to be back and um, to be in a country again where things are efficient and work well and <laughs> And there's a nice sense of, a, I suppose, more, um, of, more of a, a left areas where you get a real sense that there's a left-wing element. And um, this is very missing in Dublin. Um, I'm going to maybe, perhaps, I suppose, explain a little bit about the rhythm of the, uh, of the crisis and of the fight back in Ireland. And um, present this, I suppose, from a, a Marxist perspective. Um, and also to talk to you a little bit about, I suppose, the nature of the fight back in Ireland. Because even though Ireland... Um, together with what we call the pigs countries, that Portugal, Ireland, Italy, um, Spain, Greece, have a very deep, deep crisis. Um, and Ireland is, is together with those. That a lot of people say that the fight back in Ireland is actually quite low. Um, it, it appears low, um, and that there's particular reasons for that. Um, it's changing a little bit, so I'd like to maybe speak a little bit about that as well. Um, I'm going to try and remember to speak slowly. If I get very enthusiastic and start speaking fast again, then you have to uh, remind me. And also... Um, If I, you know, if I say something or I use a word that you don't understand, I'll try not to use jargon, but if I do, just please stop me in the middle. It's not going to make me lose my thinking or my concentration. Just, you know, I'm fair if you stop me and to explain something instead of missing the, the point of, of what we're talking about. Yeah? Um, so I suppose just to start, uh, Ireland is a very unique country. Um, it is probably the same size as Denmark, but obviously geographically we're on the edge of Europe, so we have this sort of geographic distance from the rest of Europe. But also we have our, our, his, our history and our legacy of a colonial past. And um, We had um, English occupation in Ireland for 800 years, and this occupation only ended, um, it's, going to be the, it's going to be the 100th anniversary of the first major rising against, um, the, so it was the beginning of the, of the successful Um, opposition to English occupation was in 1916, and in 1916 um, there, was, there was 16 martyrs, interestingly enough, um, and some of those martyrs were revolutionary socialists, but they were based within a nationalist movement. So the challenge for them was to, was to obviously challenge the occupation and to get this idea that Ireland could have what they called home rule, which was to govern themselves, get rid of, of the English, um, but, but again trying to build this idea that what we wanted was a socialist state. So they were revolutionaries. They, they wrote, uh, James Connolly in particular, probably the most famous, wrote a lot um, about you know, uh, socialism and revolution. But the problem, the challenge for them was that they were in this sort of nationalist movement. Um, so that in, you know, had problems for this, this movement. But coming out of 1916, by 1922, um, we had a civil war. And by this stage, we had, you know, I suppose, we had overthrown the English oppressors. But the legacy of the civil war meant that you know, what had been presented as a socialist agenda uh, for society, um, then when the civil war arrived, you had uh, what, what, uh, an organization called Fianna Foyle, who presented themselves as a national socialist party, uh, fighting with Fine Gael, um, who at the time were, they were coming out of the blue shirts and the fascist tradition. And they were like, sort of the, the two main factions that were, that were fighting it out um, in the civil war. Um, And what came out of that, I suppose, was this idea that, you know, it was really about, the idea that it was about getting rid of the English, um, in the end was what, you know, stayed in the mindset of society and the socialist agenda went away. Um, and what you ended up with was replacing the English ruling class with an Irish ruling class. Um, and nothing in that sense, nothing really changed. But in the mindset of the people in Ireland, um, we had overthrown the oppressor. And they didn't realise that they had, instead, they had inherited a new oppressor in the form, as I said, of a new Irish ruling class. And so, in some ways, this begins to explain a little bit, I suppose, the, the, the sort of the lack of a fight back in Ireland, because this sort of, you know, you're anti-state, but you're anti-state in a way that you complain an awful lot about the state, and you're very critical of the state, and you're against it, but you don't actually do anything about it. Yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a joke that we have in Ireland all the time that, 
you know, we're the best people for sitting in, in, our, in our living rooms and shouting at the television and having all of the great ideas about how we're going to change everything and how we're going to burn everything down. Um, but then we go to the pub and that's the end of the uh, social revolution. Um, but it's an important, I suppose, aspect of the psyche in Ireland. Um, uh, and unfortunately, well, not unfortunately, but what happened then after that was because we had spent so long trying to gain our, our independence that the focus was very much on building Ireland for the Irish so that the whole of the country closed down in the sense that we stopped looking internationally um, for any kind of social influence or any kind of revolutionary influence that we, we became a very closed um, society and we became a very closed economy and then you also had the influence of the Catholic Church as well and um, which was quite conservative um, and this continued on this idea of a very closed economy and um, continued for a very long time I and mean, you can imagine that the first, one of the first jobs of the new Irish government um, in the early 1930s was to, uh, they put a huge amount of emphasis into restoring the Irish language. Um, everything, you know, teachers who were teaching in schools now had to uh, teach only in the Irish language. So it was all about nation building and it was all about, you know, re generate, regenerating Irishness and, and the Gaelicization of the country. So it lost this idea of, you know, what are we trying to do here in terms of a socialist agenda and a socialist perspective. Um, and this continued on up until the 50s, until there was a change of leadership. And with the change of leadership in, in the early 1950s, um, came a new prime minister called Sean Lamas. And his idea was that actually, you know, Ireland was suffering. Um, it was a small country. It's impossible to, to grow an indigenous industry that's going to support the country because it's too small. We don't, you know, we're not big enough of a marketplace um, to, to sustain that. So his idea was that we had to, we had to change our perspective we had to become an outward looking economy. We had to get rid of these tariffs that we were charging on other products coming in from other countries. And we had to start looking outwards and um, you know, having trade relations and, and uh, diplomatic relations with other countries in Europe um, and also around the world. And primarily the relationship with England, even though we had gotten rid of um, English as rulers, we still had a very close economic connection to Britain because the majority of our exports still went to England and our currency and was still tied to the English currency. So in some ways we were still bound to them. There wasn't very much that we could do um, without you know, needing to transfer uh, to England. So th this was the idea that he had. It was like the last bastion, if you like, of our independence was to break these economic and political ties with England and to look out to the rest of, of the world. So in becoming an open economy, he had to obviously try to attract some sort of inward investment and try to grow and stimulate the Irish economy. Um, and over the following two decades, and the idea then was to start, you know, I suppose, making an application for Ireland to become members of the European Union. And because of our ties with England, and there was a real sense that, you know, that the European Union, especially the French, didn't want England as part of the European, what was then the European Economic Community. And because we were so closely associated with England through trade and the economy and the currency, they didn't want Ireland to be members of the EEC either. Um, but you know, through various diplomatic relations, eventually Ireland managed to make an, a, an independent application, and we were accepted into the European Union in 1974. And in some ways, um, because of the openness of the Irish economy and in, 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 uh, this idea that we would become an open economy in the early 1950s, in some ways, curiously for Ireland, that was in some ways such a conservative, um, and in the, you know, the eyes of many, it was such a backward country, we were actually ahead of the game in terms of neoliberalism because these ideas of you know a very small role for the state um, and bringing in you know bringing in as much finance as possible and stimulating growth um, you know bringing in these neoliberal ideas ahead of perhaps even other countries in Europe and so in some ways we were ahead of the game and this really embedded in the Irish in, in, in the mindset and in the economy these sort of ideas of the open marketplace and the freedom of, of trade and minimum state intervention and when we joined the European Union. It was like the final layer um, of stripping the um, Irish economy from any sort of government intervention. So, for example, one of the conditions when we joined the European Union in 1974 was that you couldn't have any industry subsidised uh, by the state. This goes against the competition laws of the European Union. And in Ireland at the time, one of the main industries that we did have was to do with textiles. Um, everything from you know, factories that were actually making clothes and also factories that were preparing the materials as, as well. And the, the two most important areas were Dublin and Dublin City and the inner city had an awful lot of factories, sewing factories that were providing a lot of employment. And then also in the northwest of Ireland, which is the, 
the, if you look at the map of Ireland, it's the part of the, the north of Ireland which, is, which wasn't part of, of the English occupation. It's, an independent, it's still part of, of the Republic, but sort of, um, how would you say, it's sort of far away from the rest of Ireland because geographically it's surrounded by this part that was connected to England. And this area had an awful lot of factories that were uh, preparing these materials. And again, in this area, many of these factories had to be closed down. So what you had very quickly in the early 1970s was huge unemployment overnight nearly because of these demands of the European Union and um, that we had to, to stop these, these uh, government subsidies. But in return, uh, the Irish government negotiated with the European Union that what they would allow us to have was a very low corporation tax rate. And again, this is part of this neoliberal agenda where you have you know, very, very little taxation on business and on industry and on finance. Um, and the taxation is on the workers, essentially, and particularly the, the lower income and the middle income workers. So this was the deal that was made with the European Union, that we could maintain our very low uh, corporation tax rate, because this would allow us and would help us to attract foreign investment and allow us to replace, if you like, the industry that, uh, that we weren't allowed to continue to subsidise. So that's just to give, I suppose, the context um, of the Irish situation, where you have this, you know, as I said, a post-colonial legacy, this kind of antipathy towards a fight back because you know we've fought the oppressor okay we've replaced one oppressor with another oppressor but we, we got rid of the bad oppressor so this guy is okay you know he's not so bad as the other so we can accept him we're still anti-state and we still don't like it but hey it's not so bad at least it's an Irish oppressor and not an English oppressor so you have this kind of mentality together with this new economy which is now looking more and more and more like a neoliberal economy, except no one's actually calling it that. There's this still idea that you know, we're going to recover from this, that we're going to grow our own independent indigenous industry and economy, and eventually that Ireland will recover. And in some ways, this was true. Ireland did recover. Um, but how we recovered was by attracting in a huge amount of foreign investment, and, and two types of foreign investment. One type of foreign investment came in the form of multinationals, huge, primarily huge American corporations who saw Ireland, because we have this um, advantage, I suppose, is the one thing that the English did leave us was that we all speak English. So instead of having this you know, small little country on the side of Europe that only speaks Irish, you have this small little country on the side of Europe uh, where everybody speaks English, everybody's very well educated, and hey, there's lots of unemployment, and as a result, wages are low, and also the cost um, of, of uh, so social support is very low because we have a very minimum level of social support. Um, and so it's cheap. It's cheap for com companies to come in and make an investment. And in addition to this, they also have low corporation tax rates. So many multinationals came in and invested in Ireland. Um, and in addition to this, in the 1980s, we had an opening of what they called the International Financial Services Centre. And the idea of the Financial Services Centre was to attract, um, essentially, as the name would suggest, is to, is to give like a very special, like an offshore tax haven, yeah? where they had special dispensation for companies banks who were setting up um, in this area and many of them set up what they call brass plate offices. So you have a building with a nice brass plate on the front and it has the name of this organisation but when you go inside there's maybe two people working there and all they're doing is moving money, moving it from one country to the next but because they're moving it through Ireland they don't have to pay any tax on it. So at a time, um, particularly in the early 90s, when corporation tax in Europe was being increased to levels of approximately 30% across the board, what you had then was a huge amount of uh, countries and companies sending their money to Ireland because suddenly Ireland became very attractive um, for well, moving money and in many cases probably avoiding tax and also probably laundering money um, through this new financial services centre. So these were the two types of, of investment that was coming into Ireland. Um, but what was, what was happening then as well is that because you know, most of these multinationals were not actually Irish owned, they were uh, internationally owned. An awful lot of these profits weren't staying in Ireland. They're being, you know, sent back out um, of the country. So the, the amount of, of growth was high, but the amount of, of, of uh, I suppose, profit that was remaining within Ireland remained quite low. So there wasn't a huge amount of investment into what you would describe as indigenous industry. Instead, where the money was going, as I said, was into this financial services sector, but also what the government did um, in the early 90s to sort of stimulate um, some sort of a growth was to, was to invest heavily in property. Land suddenly became very expensive, property became very expensive, and they grew this whole construction industry 
um, and, and it was viewed as a very valid part of the economy. And at the height of the boom in Ireland, this construction sector accounted for 40% of our economy. Now, any economist who has any sort of sense of, of, of social responsibility will tell you that this is, it's impossible to sustain a, a, an economy where you have 40% based on the construction industry because there's only so many houses that you need to build and there's only so many buildings that you need to build. But what was happening in Ireland um, was that we had a, we had a, a, a government party who um, had come out of this sort of civil war, who had ruled essentially for the previous 70 years without much competition. Um, and they became so, because they claimed to be like a Republican nationalist party, and they gained a huge amount of support and credibility, particularly in rural Ireland, in small communities, where they were very connected to the small businesses, they were very connected to the sports that was happening, they were very connected to the church, and all of these sort of local rural communities and they got a huge amount of support. And for 70 years, this party uh, pretty much dominated the parliament. Um, and they, because they were so connected to everything that's happening on the ground, um, they were you know, also very connected to all of these builders who were building all of these properties. And they started to you know, coalesce with them into what became a very sort of corrupt environment where they were influencing um, planning law, where they were taking bribes to allow you know, areas to be rezoned, um, for buildings to be built that didn't need to be built, for a collapse of regulation in the construction industry. So they were completely colluding with the developers in order to, you know, to benefit from that, but also to create um, this construction sector. And when, when you have this coupled with all of this financial services sector that was emerging, and you have all of this speculation that's going on, and all of these new financial products that were coming up, the financial sector then started also taking an industry, an interest rather, in what was happening in the construction sector. And what happened in Ireland was that the banks then um, started making large loans, not just to the politicians and to the developers, but they also started to uh, start making loans to themselves. So for example, um, I don't know if you've heard of a bank called the Anglo-Irish Bank. Mm -hmm. yeah? And the, the chief executive of the Anglo-Irish Bank um, was able to lend himself a significant like millions and millions um, of euro that he then invested into one of these large property deals, which didn't work out, so he lost all of this money. And then in order to hide this, they, he borrowed from another bank overnight to show that the books were okay and then gave his money back the next day. So what, what you had in Ireland then was this situation where the political elite, the financial elite, and the industrial elite, and in this case the industrial elite was the construction industry elite, are all colluding together to try and, and manipulate the economy and to manipulate society with their, with their own interests and not in the interest of wider society. So you don't have investment into um, infrastructure. You don't have investment into the public sector. And um, the public sector exists, but it, it exists as a large civil service. Um, it exists at the, you know, the level of providing education and providing health care, but it's a minimum provision. Um, and because it's a minimum provision, you also have the emergence of a very strong private sector. And so education, for example, in Ireland, even though um, you know, there's this myth that we have free education. Actually, we don't because um, people end up having to send, you know, if you want your child to get an education, you end up having to pay uh, for private sector education um, and subsidising any minimum level of public education that exists, um, you end up subsidising it and um, the family ends up subsidising it. So this idea that we have a strong public sector um, that, that's put out there is actually a complete myth. Is everyone following me so far? <laughs> Okay, so that's the context, I suppose, that we're dealing with. Um, and you know, now, as we know, Ireland is in huge crisis. Um, in 2008, we had a complete collapse of, um, you know, obviously internationally there was, a, there was a huge recession, but in Ireland in particular, this housing bubble that had been created eventually collapsed. And because this housing bubble collapsed, it brought down with it the banking sector because there was so much um, collusion between the politicians and the developers and the bankers that when, the, when that sector collapsed, um, immediately it emerged all of this corruption that was taking place within, within the banking sector. And since 2008, um, overnight actually, in 2008, one night eight people met, six of whom were bankers and two of whom were significant politicians. One was the, um, the Minister for Finance. And these eight people met in secret in the middle of the night and made a decision overnight to bail out um, the Irish, the six major national banks who had been part of this corruption and collusion um, to the tune of something like 400 billion euro. 
in a country where the, the taxation revenues, for example, um, are coming to 140 billion. So there's already a huge difference between what, this com what exists within the public purse and what's uh, going to be contained within a bailout. And there's what, you know, 250 billion euros of a discrepancy. So if the government isn't getting this money from taxation, well, the only other place that they were going to find it um, was within society, within the public sector, um, and also within wages, and also to increase the taxation on the ordinary worker. So while you have a crisis of capitalism, what you also end up with, after five years of crisis in the economy, but also four austerity budgets, and by austerity I mean uh, very, very hard cutbacks. Yeah? This is what, when I say austerity, and this is the word that we use in Ireland to describe this attack by the government on low and middle income workers and also on the public sector. So what we've ended up with is a, a, a crisis that is a crisis of capitalism, but ends up with as a human crisis. And for example, I'll just give you some statistics of the situation in Ireland today. Um, one in five children go to school hungry every day in Ireland. One in five children go to school hungry. Absolute poverty in Ireland has increased by 50% in the last four years, as has relative poverty. Relative poverty has also increased by 50% in the last four years. So this means that in total, 23%, that's nearly a quarter of Irish people, are living consistently in poverty, consistently in poverty. And there was figures released last week um, that showed that there's almost 500 young people, so people who are younger than 18 years of age, um, who are uh, homeless. Um, and so this is, you know, this is a very, very strong figure for us. Uh, the bottom 10% of society in the last uh, two years have lost 26% of their disposable income, while the highest 10% in Ireland have increased their disposable income by 8%. And these are figures that were released perhaps um, one year ago, and I'm sure now that this figure is even higher. Again, we just don't have <coughs> the statistics to show it. So the top 1% in Ireland have, um, you know, they've increased their personal wealth by something like six, I think 600 billion was their, was their wealth, and they've added another 96 billion to this. So they now command 34% of all of the wealth in Ireland, the top 1%. So the crisis is deepening, the human crisis is deepening, um, but actually what's happening is that inequality is increasing. The rich are getting richer, while the poor are getting much, much poorer, and they're also growing significantly in numbers. So as I said, it's, it's really a human crisis in Ireland. But what the ruling class is telling us, what the government is telling us, and what the media is telling us, is that we're, everywhere you hear it now, on the television, on the radio, in the papers, is that we've, this is the, 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 the favorite phrase that they use, is that we've turned the corner. The, the, the worst of the crisis is over, and that now you know, we have some small growth, that we have some, oh, you know, some company has come and they've brought 300 jobs. Um, this is announced in the media, but they don't tell us about the jobs that are being lost every day. They don't tell you, for example, in the community sector where I work, four years ago, 55,000 people worked in this sector, sector, whereas today 11,000 people work in the community sector. And you don't hear about this retrenchment. Yeah? You hear about the 300 new jobs, and the government presents this as the success of their agenda and that it's working. Whereas we know um, that this is, a, this is a crisis of capitalism. It's part of this uh, you know, bust, boom, bubble cycle of capitalism that just keeps repeating itself. The last major crisis of capitalism was in the 1930s. Many economists say that this crisis is way worse. Um, it's deeper, uh, it has a whole different dimension to it because now it's also about uh, deregulation, financial deregulation and deregulation across lots of different industries and it's, it's, it's a deeper crisis. Um, if you think about uh, unemployment in Ireland, we have 14.5% um, unemployment now. Um, they estimate that in the last five years, between 15 and 20% of workers, it's, it's fluctuated somewhere. And the economy has also shrank by 20% because at the height of the boom and compared to now, the economy um, was 20% bigger than it is now. So again, you can see this relationship between capitalism and workers. When the workers are taken out of the workforce by 15%, the, the size of the economy is also shrinking by 15%. So the workers are producing the wealth and when the workers aren't working, the wealth is shrinking, but somehow the ruling class is still managing to take whatever profit is being made for themselves. Yeah? So there's a direct relationship there between the number of workers that are being taken out of the economy and the size of the economy. Um, emigration is another problem in Ireland. We're losing 70,000 people every year are being lost in Ireland, and a lot of those are young people. In Ireland, we have uh, 
14.5-15% generally unemployment, but among young people this figure is 40%. So if you're a graduate in Ireland, it's fairly certain that you're not going to be able to get a job. So of these 70,000 people who are emigrating every year, an awful lot of these are young people. And this also has implications for the fight back, because we don't have, uh, we don't, you know, we don't have a very strong fight back from young people in Ireland because they're not there. Yeah? I mean, any, you know, their, their major issue is unemployment, but they've had to emigrate, and so they're not there to, I suppose, support the fight back, which many people say in Ireland it's mostly kind of middle-aged people who are fighting back, and there, there's good reason for that, um, which I'm going to come to now um, in a moment. So that's just, I suppose, you know, Ireland has gone through this you know, independence, we've gone through this problems of having, you know, deep recession in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s and in the 80s and then suddenly in the 90s we have a boom. A boom that's fueled, as I said, by inward investment, speculation, finance, construction industry and now we have this collapse. Um, what happened in the late 1980s to try to stimulate the boom in the Irish economy was that the government made um, a pact uh, Another word, like a, a, an agreement between the trade unions and, and the Irish government was that in order to try to attract some more investment into Ireland that they would have an agreement that wages would stay the same for the next five years. There would be no increase in wages and in return for this the government would try as much as possible to guarantee that there would be no job losses, particularly in the public sector. Yeah? So what happened at this time was not only did the unions make this agreement with the government but a new layer of trade union executives emerged in the, in the trade union movement who were now being paid, essentially, um, to, they were being paid to be union executives and to organise, but actually they were in a relationship with the government and with the bosses. Because the moment they entered into this agreement, um, they had taken the side of the bosses. They agreed for themselves also very, very healthy salaries. Um, so you know now they're getting a wage of uh, maybe 60,000 euro, whereas the average industrial wage in Ireland is maybe 35,000 euro. So they, they moved themselves away from organised workers, from the workers' struggle, and they moved themselves closer to the bosses and closer um, to the ruling class through the government. So this was a significant shift because it took the working class and it took the workers out of the organised movement and took the, them out of the organised struggle. Yeah? So an, another important aspect of this is that you have an awful lot of the people who are these uh, members of these trade unions, but most importantly who are the executive, are members of the Labour Party. And the Labour Party is who we now have in coalition government, along with this other party that I was saying, um, called Fine Gael, who came from the Civil War, who are really a very right-wing, five minutes away, okay. <laughs> um, they're a very right-wing party, and we now have those in coalition. We have the Labour Party, and we have this right-wing government in power. So just to say very quickly a little bit about the Labour Party. Um, in the last election, this party I said Fianna, Fianna Foil, um, which is an Irish word, uh, but I like to call them Fianna Fail because they have failed completely. Um, and I will always call them this from now on. So if you go to Ireland, you must also call them Fianna Fail to everybody that you speak with. But Fianna Fail had ruled, as I said, you know, had, had had a very strong period of um, involvement in government for almost 70 years. In the last election, the, the one good thing that came out of this deep, deep crisis, despite the human crisis, was that in the last general election, Fianna Fáil were completely wiped out, completely wiped out. They, had, they lost pretty much all of their representation um, in Parliament, along with what were called the Progressive Democrats, who were an extremely right-wing party who had been in coalition with them. They were completely taken out of the political picture, and the vote split between the Labour Party and this very right-wing party called Fine Gael, and they are both now in coalition with each other. Now, in the mindset of the Irish, the, the move to the Labour Party was a move to the left, because even though you know, they're not a radical left-wing organisation, in the minds of the ordinary person in Ireland who never voted Labour in their lives, voting Labour was a shift to the left. So the vote split between these two parties. But with this shift to Labour also came a betrayal of the people who had voted for them, because people thought, and um, because Labour were you know, claiming to be left-wing, and if you heard them speak at the time of the election, you would say that they were a radical left-wing organisation and on the side of the people and on the side of the workers. And also because they're so strongly involved in the trade union movement that people were really expecting them to do something and to deliver 
and to stop this bailout of the banks and to stop the cutting back of the public sector and the attack on services and the attack on jobs and the attack on low and middle income workers. So people feel in Ireland very betrayed by the union movement and by the Labour Party because even though they presented all of this in, in the elections, um, they're now in government with this extremely right wing party and they haven't delivered on any of their election promises. So that goes in some way a little bit as well to explain the lack of the fight back because you have this legacy, post-colonial legacy, but you also have this trade union movement which is now in bed with the bosses, in bed with the government and won't call for a general strike and won't organise workers and um, has stepped away, I suppose, from, from, from organising the struggle. Um, so what, why, what kind of a fight back do we have in Ireland at the moment? Well, in the last um, 12 months, this coalition government, as part of their deal with the European Union and with the Troika, um, one of the agreements that they had is to impose what is very similar to the poll tax that Margaret Thatcher tried to bring in in England. It's called the household tax. And I suppose up until the household tax, um, it was very difficult for people to, to, to fight back in some ways because you, know, you were losing your jobs. Um, if you did have a public sector job, you lost about 15% of your income because they were taking this out in extra taxes that you had to pay, extra social insurance, etc. So the government was you know, taking always from you, but you had no control over this because it was already taken from your wages before you got your wages, or your local hospital was being closed down, um, or the local library. And even though communities might have come out and protested against the hospital being closed down, this was a small protest, localized protest, and um, it didn't link with other campaigns. Um, you know, once they won, if they won, they won, and that was fine. If they didn't win, they didn't win, but it wasn't connecting with other campaigns. So very localized and fragmented. Um, struggles were emerging, um, and as I said, you know, the government was taking from you, but it, it wasn't taking it from your hand. It was never coming to you in the first place. But the difference with the household tax campaign is that this was the first time that the government was asking people in Ireland to to give them money. So the idea behind it was that they wanted to bring in a property tax as part of this EU IMF Troika deal, um, which was part of the bailout agreement. Um, they wanted to charge. Uh, to create a database of people who owned property. So the best way to get this database was to introduce this new charge, this household tax, which is a very small little charge, it's only 100 euro every year, and you have to register and pay this charge. Now from our point of view, as, as, as revolutionary socialists and as campaigners and organisers on the ground, this presented us with the perfect opportunity to grow a strong campaign, because the only thing that you had to do was nothing. Don't register, don't pay, and this, you know, this is an act of civil disobedience and it's an act of resistance. But it was very easy to convince people to do nothing. Yeah? So, <laughs> so immediately overnight you have you know, a very strong movement um, who are quite determined. Um, you know, and, and also the great thing about this, this uh, idea of the poll tax was that if you were a homeowner you were expected to pay 100 euro. But really what made this campaign very successful was that in rural areas if you, uh, the, the sewage system isn't very well developed, so you have a lot of septic tanks where people have their, um, you know, one tank maybe which is servicing a small number of houses. And up until, up until now, the government would um, maintain these and would pay for them to be replaced in cleaning, etc. Whereas now people were being expected to pay for it themselves, as well as this household tax. So it made people all over the country really, really, really angry, especially in these country areas, in the rural areas, because of this septic tank charge. So a very, very strong campaign was built by a number of organisations, including our own organisation and other radical left-wing, uh, well, the one other radical, so-called radical left-wing party that exists in the country, as well as, the best part, was that a huge amount of ordinary grassroots people who had never been political in their whole lives joined this campaign. 30,000 people joined this campaign and became active in the campaign. And by the deadline of the 31st of March last year, we had 52% of all of the households in the country who were eligible to pay this tax boycotted the tax. That represents about 700,000 households in the end. Um, that's 52% of all of these households. And it's the biggest act of civil disobedience that we've ever seen in the history of the state. The majority said, no, we're not paying this tax. And this has thrown the government into complete disarray. They, they, you know, how to respond to this? They've come out with lots of different threats. Oh, we're going to take it out of your taxes. You won't be able to sell your house. There's a rumour now going around that you can't stand for election if you haven't paid this tax, and this, you, know, you can't have this public service if you don't pay this tax. And, and the government is now panicking, and because we do have 
we do have this very strong campaign, um, which is, as I said, you know, it's, it's, it's a real act of community-based resistance. And the challenge for us now, as they're also attacking, um, you know, Hope Helps, uh, or, or people who come to the, to the homes of elderly people, disabled people, people with serious illnesses, and they're, they're taking those away, they're, they're cutting the personal assistance from the disabled, they're closing down hospitals, they're cutting back schools. And um, you know, the, the challenge now in this campaign is to start uniting all of, suddenly we have a platform where we can take all of these small struggles that have existed over the last five years and start uniting them because the household tax is across the whole of the country. So to, to try and unite all of these campaigns so that they present a broad movement and a broad anti-austerity campaign um, within which we can build a really strong resistance against the government. So while you might say that there is a very low level of struggle in Ireland, and some people do say that there is a low level of struggle, we have this huge boycott. And we also have lots of these small community-based campaigns that through the boycott campaign can start now to become um, more strongly connected. But there's also been um, quite a number of workers' occupations over the last 24 months maybe. Um, and I've yet to hear of a workers' occupation that hasn't been successful in, in fighting their, their employers and getting their demands. Maybe some of these occupations are only 10 workers, maybe there are 100 workers. But the idea that one is successful gives the next occupation the sense that, well, the confidence that we can also be successful. And as revolutionary socialists, our job is to be at the heart of these workers' occupations, at the heart of the campaign against the household tax, at the heart of all of these individual community struggles, to make sure that we're putting our politics into those and that we're uniting all the campaigns so that what we end up with, you know, hopefully in the very near future, is a very strong, strong, broad campaign, um, anti-capitalist as well as um, anti-austerity, and that we can use that as a base for building on um, and for fighting back. And um, there's a lot more to say, um, actually, about Ireland, um, but hopefully, maybe you know, when we have this discussion and we have these um, conversations, a little bit more of that will come out. But I leave it there for the moment and uh, look forward to having a good discussion with you. Thanks for listening.